All right, well, we're going to start this morning. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to Christ Community. Uh, so great to see everybody here this morning. Uh, I think most of you, maybe not all of you, know that uh, my family was on vacation the last two weekends, and it was good to be away, but it's also really good to be back with our church family this morning. So uh, great to see you, and uh, especially if you're visiting this morning, uh, it's great to have you with us, and uh, uh, we hope that uh, you'll experience uh, the power and the love of Christ this morning. Um, I'm going to share a few announcements before we uh, get into a time of prayer and, and music. Um, is that Heather? Where's Heather in here? Oh, do you want to come back up again? Okay. Heather's going to come talk about the family uh, fun day that's coming up uh, next weekend. <laughs> Likes the spotlight. Hello. So we are getting closer to our Incredible World um, Family Day. We're really excited. And um, we do have at-home packs. If you know anybody from our church who hasn't come back yet because they have to stay home, you know, to protect their family, whether they work at the hospital or whatever the reason, we do have at-home packs that we can get to them. But we are setting it up in stations so that families can go through together. And um, really, we just want to encourage everybody and encourage the kids to learn about God and to just kind of see everybody having fun together again. So um, it will be at the Winters. The address, yes, is up there. And it will be from 9 to 12. And we do, um, if you were volunteering, to bring like a canopy tent or tables or chairs, if we could connect so we could get those things over to the Winter's house, that would be really great. And if you would like to volunteer to help out, that would be awesome as well. So we're really excited. The day's coming. Hopefully the weather cooperates. <laughs> Real quick, Heather. Uh, yes. What are, what are some of the needs that you still have for volunteers? So we really just need people to stand at the stations and kind of just help guide the families through. So there'll be lots of signs and everything, so it's pretty self-sufficient. Everything is very personal, all the crafts, everything, all the sets are, you know, very individual, so we're not sharing things. But um, just to kind of direct people as they're going through and things like that. So, and encourage, lots of encouragement that day. Awesome. Thanks, Heather. All right. Um, we also have a uh, young adults group that is uh, starting to meet back up. I think the second uh, last Sunday was the first week back for them and uh, for college, uh, those right out of college. And that's at the LaCroix home in Westfield um, at, um, actually, I don't have the address there. Yeah, there it is. 131 Park Drive in, in Westfield. Um, you can see Dave or Matt LaCroix, which I don't think either one of them are here today. Or you can just see me if you want more information about that. Um, it's for those in our church, but a lot of uh, young adults from outside of our church also attend uh, that uh, small group in Bible study. Uh, so you can see me if you want more information on that. Um, also, we haven't uh, really given an opportunity for people to become members in probably over a year, or at least a year. And so uh, we've got our next congregational meeting coming up in September. And so we just want to give those who are interested uh, to become members of the church an opportunity to do that in September. Uh, there's a little bit of a process to go through. Uh, so please see me if you're interested in that process. Um, I know some people kind of go through the process and the class and all that just to find out more about the church, even if they're not maybe going to be members right away. Um, so you can be part of that just to find out more about the church, or if you want to continue through the process and, and actually become a member um, in September. Also, we have uh, two church prayer meetings this month, uh, one on August 11th and one on August uh, 27th at 7 p.m. for both of those. Uh, they will be on Zoom. They won't be in person uh, for this month. Um, so if I don't have your a uh, email address, uh, please let me have that or give that to me uh, before you leave today so I can send you the link uh, for the prayer meetings. Uh, it's just a great time to kind of connect and I mean, more on a personal level, share prayer requests and praises and then pray for each other. Obviously, uh, we all need prayer. Our church needs prayer and the, and the country needs a lot of prayer. Um, this Thursday, we're having another work day at the building. Um, in Southampton, and uh, we're going to need maybe five to ten people to come participate. Yeah, we've got some more work to do inside uh, the sanctuary on the floor, and then some work down in the basement. So uh, if you can make that on Thursday, 
Uh, just ask that you bring your own uh, mask and gloves and all those kinds of things. Any tools that people need to bring, Ted? Uh, not, this time. not this time? Okay. Um, so that's Thursday, and that's going to be uh, from 6 to 8. Um, at, the, at the welcome table, right as you came in, there's a card there. Uh, if you would like to sign that or just write some words of encouragement to Amelia Longhi. Um, she had her surgery uh, about a week and a half ago. Uh, sounds like she's doing well and recovering well. It's a, probably a long process to get through that surgery she had. Uh, her body really just needs to readjust to it. Uh, but we want to send her a card just to let her know that we're thinking of her and, and praying for her. So we can do that uh, at the welcome te- uh, table outside. Is that all I have up there, Ted? Anything else? That's it? Okay. It was a uh, call to worship this morning. I'm going to read from Romans 12, uh, verses 1 and 2. Uh, maybe a familiar couple of verses for some of you. Uh, but I think it's a great way just to get started this morning. It says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice, as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. You know, I love Sunday mornings because it's an opportunity for us as a church family and brothers and sisters to come and worship together and, in a sense, offer our bodies as living sacrifices. Uh, I always kind of say this in the past, but I, I like the fact that we live in the New Covenant times so we don't have to come and slaughter animals and make a big mess, right? So we can come and worship God just by singing and through his word and fellowship. Um, but really, if we think about worship, we need to think about it beyond Sunday mornings. Sunday morning is just kind of the tip of the iceberg for the Christian life. We have to live the Christian life the other six days of the week. And there's so many ways that we can worship God uh, with our bodies and with our lives. Um, and so maybe today, this morning, will just be the time to be encouraged in that. Uh, we come before God. Um, receive his grace this morning, receive his mercy and his strength so that we can go out uh, tomorrow and the rest of this week uh, to really worship him and glorify him. So if you'll bow with me, uh, let's pray and then we'll go into a time of of music. Father, we thank you so much for uh, this day. God, just thank you for the day that you created. And God, we thank you for the bodies that we live in. Um, Some of us are young, some of us are older, uh, but regardless, uh, we still have breath in our lungs uh, to sing, to Uh, uh, give praises to you with our mouths and with our hearts and with our lives. And so may you just be greatly worshipped, not just this morning as we worship you corporately, but as we go from this place, God, I pray that we would just see that our our lives are are meant to be um, uh, glorifying to you, God, that we need to bring attention to you wherever we can. We need to share the gospel whenever we can and uh, reflect uh, who you are in your character. And God, we all need uh, much help in not falling into the patterns of this world. Uh, God, they can sometimes consume us, and before we know it, we're in that place where we're just kind of carried along with the world and its ways. And so we also ask for your grace to uh, just help us be mindful of uh, the traps and the temptations all around us, and that we won't get sucked into those things, and, uh, and then lose our ability to bring you glory. So uh, may we just... Uh, Sing with a joyful heart this morning, God, that we would uh, listen to your word and a message this morning with um, open minds and ready to receive from your spirit. Praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning and welcome to Christ Community. I'm so happy that each of you joined us this morning. Isaiah 25, 1, O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name for you have done wonderful things, plans formed of old, faithful and sure. As we sing today, I pray that each of us will reflect on the wonderful things God has done in each of our lives and give him the honor and worship that is due to him. Please stand.
because of who I am, but because of what you've done, not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. I am a flower quickly fading, here today and gone tomorrow, a wave tossed in the ocean, a vapor and the you and I praise you that we know that we are safely in your hand, that you have called us, you have forgiven us from our sins, that uh, we can trust in your faithfulness and that you are with us through everything that we go through. I pray today that as we listen to your word that you would just open our hearts and open our eyes to your ways and that we would be drawn closer to you. Amen. Please be seated. Well, just a few other things I uh, just wanted to mention before we get into our, our time of prayer. Uh, we were going to do communion today, um, but we were, we were down to one last elder. Um, Andy Krikovich is down in the Carolinas getting some training uh, for his job. And uh, Andy Longi, I think his family's up in Vermont uh, this weekend. And so we had Chris, but Chris called me this morning and he's been on call uh, with his job and he got called out. So uh, he wasn't able to come either. So we're going to postpone it one more week to do it uh, next Sunday, uh, but keep uh, Chris in your prayers because he hasn't had much sleep in the last couple of days, has he? <laughs> Since 8 a.m., wow. So yeah, keep him in prayer. Keep Jen and the kids in prayer too, right? <laughs> um, also, if you have kids here uh, and um, we can't do child care and nursery and all those things uh, right now because of the pandemic stuff, but um, Heather Shepherd provides uh, resources out in the lobby area. And you can always go out there. There's like boxes, individual boxes for kids uh, with things to do. And um, there's lesson kind of plans to go along with the sermon. So you either can do them out there or outside, or you can even bring stuff in here and, and do it in the room. So uh, if that's you and uh, need some stuff for your kids, it's available uh, right as you go out those, those doors there. Um, also, uh, we used to pass the offering around during the service. Uh, but again, just to kind of cut down on things that we're all touching, uh, there's an offering back, uh, box back in the back of the room there uh, if you want to place your offerings in there. Um, so I think that's it as far as those kinds of announcements. But we want to give you an opportunity this morning to share what God might be doing in your life, uh, whether that be a praise or a thanksgiving or a prayer request. And that way we can kind of uh, edify each other 
uh, in that sharing time and then know what to pray for each other uh, throughout the week. Uh, who would like to start uh, with sharing something this morning? Yeah, back in the back, Linda. I missed the first part. Can you say the first part again? Oh, okay. Oh, hives. Okay. And now they're gone? Okay. They're gone. Great. Thank you. Yeah, it's always good to hear updates, too, on previous prayer requests. No, how God answers. Yep, Christian? Okay. Yeah. Ted? Oh, okay. Sure, definitely. Jeff? Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for those encouraging words. Uh, I'm just going to repeat some of these just for people that might be listening outside. Uh, Linda gave praise for uh, Savannah's hives um, going away and being gone. Gretchen uh, just asked for continued prayer for Amelia, uh, recovering from her surgery. And uh, Jeff is uh, giving praise for who we are in him and all that he does for us. That We just need to continue to thank him, especially in these tough times. Uh, moving on, anybody else? Yeah, Zach. Great. Thanks, Zach. Yeah, for those outside, Zach, just give praise for, uh, you know, just what really matters during these times and uh, just kind of focus on what's important. So thanks, Zach. Yeah, Glenn? Uh, sorry to hear that. Glenn asked for prayer for a close family member of Ryan uh, that passed away. Elizabeth? All right, so that was a prayer request for Andy Grinkovich as he continues his training down in the Carolinas and uh, uh, for Chris and the kids as well as their home. Uh, a prayer request that was uh, mentioned before the service, uh, John and Jane Shermer asked for prayer for their son, Michael. Uh, he's found out that he has cancer, uh, so we want to definitely lift him up and Ask for God's strength for him and uh, God's healing for his body. Anybody else? All right, well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. And uh, if you'll bow with me, and uh, if anybody feels led to pray out loud for one of these 
uh, prayer request or praise that was mentioned, feel free to do so. And, um, and if anything else comes to mind, uh, feel free to pray for that as well. Let's pray.
Father, thank you just for the uh, praise report from Linda that Savannah's hives are gone. Uh, God, it's just good to uh, know when we pray that you listen and you hear and uh, you answer in your, in your good time. Um, also lift up John and Holly. God, it's good to always see them here on Sunday morning, especially with Holly and her foot and uh, uh, the healing there and uh, just still making the effort in the wheelchair coming and uh, participating in worship. So we just pray for continued strength for them and grace and a uh, quick healing for her so she can get back on her feet and uh, get back to life as, as normal as can be. Um, God, we thank you for uh, all the good gifts that you give us. God, you're the father of the heavenly lights, and um, you care for us, you love us um, in many different ways. Uh, one of the ways is just even financially, God, that you give us the, the finances to live life, to support ourselves, to uh, have shelter and food and all those things. Um, God, we uh, just pray that uh, as we give back to you, God, we give up offerings to you, uh, that you would just bless uh, the giver, um, that you would uh, use those uh, offerings to your uh, glory and to your kingdom. And uh, we also just pray as we go to your word this morning, uh, that it should be a powerful time. God, we know that when we open your word, uh, it's your word, and uh, it's like a sword that can just reach right down into our hearts and... Um, Speak to us directly. God, we each are coming from different places, maybe. Maybe all had different kinds of weeks. And uh, maybe need to hear a little something different from the same passage uh, this morning. And we just trust through the Holy Spirit that that will happen. And uh, that we will grow to be more like uh, your son, Jesus Christ. Praise in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So if you have your Bible this morning, we're going to be in the book of Obadiah. Obadiah. When was the last time you heard a sermon from Obadiah, huh? <laughs> Probably it's been a while, I'm guessing. Uh, if you uh, missed last week, uh, Chris Dolan did an excellent job in the book of, of Jonah. Uh, kind of a, you know, one of those books that maybe we're somewhat familiar with, but uh, he just brought out a lot of just different things from that book that I hadn't even thought of. And uh, I thought it was, it was great for me. And so if you missed it, definitely go online either to our YouTube channel, which you can just put the name of the church, Christ Community, Hampshire County, and you'll find it, or on our website, cchc.church, and uh, definitely go back and listen to that. Um, also, uh, I went back and listened to Randy Smythe's message from a couple weeks ago. Um, also a great message about missions and the heart of God and um, just our desire to live out the great commandment and the great commission. Well, so uh, we're doing Obadiah today, so you might be thinking, does Pastor Chad know the order of the book of the Bible? Uh, doesn't he know that Obadiah comes before Jonah? I do know that. Um, it just happened out with our schedule and vacation, and uh, Chris was already planning Jonah. And so uh, I said, you know, go ahead and do that, and I'll come behind you and do Obadiah. So I apologize to the OCD people in the crowd. If that's really messing with you to have the books out of order, I apologize. Uh, so Obadiah, it's the shortest book in the Old Testament, and it's uh, one of only five one-chapter books in the whole Bible. The other four are in the uh, New Testament. And uh, because it's the most minor of the minor prophets, I think sometimes it doesn't get the attention that it deserves. Um, it's actually a, an amazing book, and maybe hopefully you had an opportunity to read it this last week or in the previous weeks or Maybe after this uh, sermon, you'll go back and read it. I'll actually read it for us this morning, uh, here in a few minutes. But although it's a very short book, it really packs a punch, I believe, in tying together the history of the Old Testament. It reaches back all the way to Genesis, and then also kind of reaches into even the New Testament in, in some aspects. Um, so it's a great book if you kind of want to do a little research. You have to work on it in this book because it's short to kind of see how it all fits together. And hopefully I'll, I'll help us with that this morning. But it is a, a great book. Um, and it's amazing the way that it gives continuity to God's sovereign plan for his people, the Jews. Not only does it talk about God's hand on them and his protective hand on them, but I also think that it really addresses our greatest problem as human beings. I'm not going to tell you what that is right yet. We'll get to that later as we get deeper into the book. But I'm going to start this morning by reading Obadiah. And I don't get an opportunity to read a whole book of the Bible that often, but I figure, you know, it's one chapter. Let's give it a try this morning. So if you have your Bibles and uh, you want to look to Obadiah, it's right after 
Amos, right before Jonah, uh, somewhat in the middle, a little bit farther to the end of the book than in the middle of your Bible. It's in the Minor Prophets. The vision of Obadiah. This is what the Sovereign Lord says about Edom. We have heard a message from the Lord. An envoy was sent to the nations to say, Rise, and let us go against her for battle. See, I will make you small among the nations. You will be utterly despised. The pride of your heart has deceived you. You who live in the clefts of the rocks and make your home on the heights. You who say to yourself, who can bring me down to the ground? Though you soar like the eagle and make your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. If thieves came to you, if robbers in the, in the night, oh, what a disaster awaits you. Would they not steal only as much as they wanted? If grape pickers came to you, would they not leave a few grapes? But how Esau will be ransacked, his hidden treasures pillaged. All your allies will force you to be uh, to the border. Your friends will deceive and overpower you. Those who eat your bread will set a trap for you, but you will not detect it. In that day, declares the Lord, will I not destroy the wise men of Edom, men of understanding in the mountains of Esau? Your warriors, O uh, Teman, will be terrified, and every one in Esau's mountains will be cut down in the slaughter. Because of the violence against your brother Jacob, you will be covered with shame. You will be destroyed forever. On the day you stood aloof, while strangers carried off his wealth, and foreigners entered his gates, and cast lots for Jerusalem. You were like one of them. You should not look down on your brother in the day of his misfortune, nor rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their destruction, nor boast so much in the day of their trouble. You should not march through the gates of my people in the day of their disaster, nor look down on them in their calamity in the day of their disaster, nor seize their wealth in the days of disaster. You should not wait at the crossroads to cut down their fugitives, nor hand over their survivors in the day of their trouble. The day of the Lord is near for all nations. As you have done, it will be done to you. Your deeds will return upon your head. Just as you drank on my holy hill, so all the nations will drink continually. They will drink and drink and be as if they had never been. But on Mount Zion will be deliverance. It will be holy, and the house of Jacob will pros, uh, possess its inheritance. The house of Jacob will be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame. The house of Esau will be uh, stubble, and they will set it on fire and consume it. There will be no survivors from the house of Esau. The Lord has spoken. People from the Negev will occupy, occupy the mountain of Esau, and people from the foothills will possess the land of the Philistines. They will occupy the fields of Ephraim and Samaria, and Benjamin will possess Gilead. This company of Israelite exiles who are in Canaan will possess the land as far as Zarephath. The exiles from Jerusalem who are in uh, Zepharad will possess the towns of the Negev. Deliverance will go up on Mount Zion to govern the mountain mountains of Esau, and the kingdom will be the Lord's. So the name Obadiah means servant of the Lord and appears 20 times in the Old Testament. Um, Obadiah is a relatively common name in the Old Testament, um, but the Obadiah that we see in this book that wrote this book is not related or is not one of those other Obadiahs in the rest of the uh, Old Testament as far as being the author and the dates, nothing is really known about this, this person. He's very obscure. You don't see much in the book about details of who he is. And so it's kind of hard to really know who this author is. The only kind of clues we get is it talks about Jerusalem. It talks about Judah. It talks about Zion. So maybe he has an affinity to the southern kingdom. Maybe that's where he's from. Maybe that's where he lives. As far as the date of writing, it's also difficult to determine. Uh, it's definitely tied to the Edomites who assaulted uh, Jerusalem 
which is described in uh, verses 10 through 14. Obadiah apparently wrote shortly after these attacks, and there was a few different attacks on Jerusalem by people who might have been the Edomites. Uh, a couple of situations here. Uh, one was in uh, or between 848 to 841 BC, and that was during the reign of Rehoboam. Also, there was another attack uh, of Jerusalem, the, really the major attack by the Babylonians in 586 BC. Uh, which the Edomites said, uh, they said they applauded that attack. It actually says that in, in Psalms, in Psalm 137, 7, it says, Remember, Lord, what the Edomites did on the day Jerusalem fell. Tear it down, they cried. Tear it down to its foundations. So that's, that's, that's possibly the event that maybe Obadiah is talking about. As we look at the background and setting of this, the Edomites may not know much about them. You kind of maybe read about them in the Old Testament. They are the descendants of Esau. They are the descendants of that main family of Jacob and Esau, uh, going back to the original family of the, of the Jews. And so Esau was the firstborn twin of Isaac and Rebekah. You can find that in Genesis 25. And Esau, it says, struggled with uh, Jacob even in the womb. There was this ongoing battle from the very beginning. Before they even entered the world, they were struggling with each other. Now, this name Esau means hairy. And it says in Genesis 25, because he was like a hairy garment all over. His other name was Edom, meaning red, because he sold his birthright to Jacob for a bowl of red stew. So his two names were Esau and Edom. And obviously, the Edom name was what ended up becoming the Edomites. So that's the connection all the way back to Genesis of this group of people that Obadiah is talking about. Uh, he showed disregard for the covenant promises. He married Canaanite women which, women, which he wasn't supposed to do. And he also married a daughter of Ishmael, um, and which he wasn't supposed to do. So after having his fa uh, father's blessing stolen from him by Jacob, it said he became a man of the open country. So he kind of left his family residence and where that family was being raised, and he went to a different region uh, to kind of set up his uh, clan and his people, and settled in a region that's just south of the Dead Sea. Uh, all of Israel is fairly barren. There's not a lot of trees, not a lot of vegetation in, in the whole country, but there's pockets of it. Israel has some trees and some vegetation along the Jordan River. There's some. But when you get down to the Dead Sea and then south of that, it gets very desert-like, very barren in that region. That's where the Edomites set up. Um, you might be familiar with a pretty popular, uh, what do I say this, um, uh, place where, uh, I'm trying to think of the word, it's a place called Petra. So if you watch the movie Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, remember that movie? The, one of the last scenes, they go to this place, and there's a big, big cliff. And uh, there's this building that's carved out of the cliff. And so if you go online and just research Petra, you'll see this amazing building that's literally carved out of a, a cliff in the mountains. That's where the Edomites were. That's the location where they, where they lived. And so they were known for living there. They were known for making their, uh, their homes in the mountains, in the cliffs. Uh, what was important about this region is that it was on what's called the King's Highway. The King's Highway was the road that connected Egypt to Israel to Asia and then to Europe. So if you made things in Egypt that wanted to be sold in Asia or in Europe, you went right by the Edomites. You went right through Israel on the King's Highway. So it was a, a, a territory, a place that a lot of people wanted. But because they were entrenched in these cliffs, in these caves, um, in these mountains, it was really hard to attack the Edomites. And so you can see why they might have had a level of pride about who they were, about the land that they occupied. And, uh, and that's a lot of what Obadiah is talking about here, is this pride about who they are and where they lived. Um, this height, the, the place where they lived gave them a great vantage point of the surrounding areas. Verse 4 in Obadiah talks about that they soared like eagles and says they made their nest among the stars. <clears throat> Obviously, that's like figurative language to say that they were high up where they lived, and they were really proud about that. Well, Jacob and Esau struggled, like I said before, before they were even born, and this really forms the background for the prophecy of Obadiah. 
Let me read from Genesis 25, 23. It says, The Lord said to her, Two nations are in her womb, and two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. So Jacob becomes Israel, and Esau becomes Edom. So then you see this, this constant battle and fight between the Israelites and and the Edomites. And it all goes back to these two brothers, twin brothers, uh, back in, in Genesis. So now if you know the story of the Israelites, when they became very numerous in Egypt as slaves, eventually God released them and, and got them out of Egypt, and they traveled up to the Promised Land. Well, as they were traveling through, guess where they had to go through? They had to go through the Edomites. But the Edomites didn't want them to come through, and they, they rejected them. And uh, so a lot of this judgment that we see in, in uh, Obadiah it comes out of the Edomites not favoring God's people, the uh, Israelites. But even though the Edomites denied Israel's passage through their land, God at that time uh, instructed them uh, to be still kind to, to Edom and Edomites. So we have here this guy, Obadiah, he receives this vision. And a lot of this vision that he receives, and a lot of what he expresses in this book is what made God angry to, about the Edomites and, and, their, and his judgment on them? And so he pronounces total destruction upon Edom because of their mistreatment of the Israelites. So let's look a little bit at the history of the Edomites and kind of what they had done to the Israelites. So when Israel got their first king, Saul, at very, right off the beginning, the Edomites opposed them. And that's about 100, or actually 1,043 B.C., so that's going way back. Uh, the Edomites were then subdued by David and Solomon. But then again, they fought against Jehoshaphat. So there's this constant back and forth. They were successful in a rebellion against uh, Joram, another one of the kings. But then they conquered Judah when uh, uh, Amaziah was king. Uh, but then they again re re regained their freedom during uh, Ahaz. Later on, when the Assyrians and the Babylonians came through, they conquered the Edomites. Now, in the 5th century B.C., the Edomites were forced out of their land by the Nabataeans. And then they moved to an area in Palestine closer to Jerusalem. And at that time, their name changed from Edomites to Edomians. Edomians. That, may, that, na that term or that name might sound familiar to you. Who's a popular person in the New Testament that was an Edomian? King Herod, okay? So when the Romans came in uh, before Christ and kind of took over the land, they set up King Herod at Edomian as basically the, the sovereign ruler over Israel. Now, if you were a Jew from Judah, what would you think about that? They knew who the Edomians were. They knew that went back to the Edomites, and they know that went all the way back to Esau. So you can see how even all the way down to the time of Christ, there's still this struggle between Jacob and Esau happening right there in, in Israel and in Jerusalem. There's still this contention, this, this battle that's going on. And so what does King Herod do out of his hatred to the Jews? He knows that there's this king that has been born, that has been being raised up. And out of fear that an Israelite king would take over the land and kind of kick him out or kill him or whatever, he declares that all the baby boys be killed. It's a very drastic thing that he does, but it's in, in, heartfelt going back in much of history of the Israelites. So what we see here is that um, in Earlier on, the Edomites wanted Jerusalem to be destroyed. But here's the ironic thing. In 70 AD, when the Israelites rose up against the rebellion against the Romans, Romans come in and they're fighting over Jerusalem. The Edomians actually join the Jews in trying to save Jerusalem. So at one point they wanted to destroy it. Now they want it saved. But regardless, the Romans come in, completely destroy the city, uh, pretty much destroy you know, devastate the Jewish people to, uh, to just down to a small group of people. But at that time, they also wiped the Edomians off the map. And what's interesting about that is that is exactly what Obadiah said would happen. So that 
battle and that conquering of the Romans of Jerusalem to fill the prophecy that we see in Obadiah. Obadiah, verse 10 says, you will be cut off forever. Verse 18 says, and no survivor shall remain of the house of Esau. The Bible's amazing, isn't it? Like you have this prophecy and these things that these, these men heard from God and these visions they got thousands and thousands of years before, and then you see them one at a time being fulfilled in very clear, very distinct ways. And God said that they would be no more, and that was what happened. So let's look a little bit at like, the historical and theological themes of the book. Really, the, the book is a case study of Genesis 12, 1 through 3. It really talks about God will bless those who are for his people, and God will curse those who are against his people. And we see that very clearly here in, in the prophecy, but also in the fulfillment of that prophecy. We see the judgment of Edom by God for cursing Israel, and we see the future restoration of Judah in verses 19 through 21 at the end of the book. It, it alludes to this restoration of Judah later on. A simple way to look at the book of Obadiah that we can relate to is that he is going to have his sovereign hand on his people. As much as other nations wanted to destroy them, as much as they did what they could do internally to implode with their sin and rebellion, God kept them together. He continued to bless them and use them as his people. Now, Obadiah isn't a direct prophecy to us as Christians, but there are some principles there that I do believe apply to us. And that principle that God's hand is going to be on us as his people is true as Christians. We're going to have enemies. We're going to have people who want to wipe us off the face of the map. And they're trying that in many countries around the world. I'm sure you hear stories of that all the time. And they've tried that in the past. And who knows what our future in America has to hold. Uh, you know, we might not face death necessarily. Um, but there will be continued maybe changing of laws and restrictions and other types of persecution on us as Christians, uh, even in our country. The Edomites often harm the Israelites, but in the end, the Edomites as a people are no more. And the Jews, at least as a, as a nation, are maybe as strong as ever. So even in our time, in our day and age, you look at Obadiah and you see the fulfillment of that. You, you don't see Edomites anymore, and yet you see this nation of Israel thriving in a, an amazing way. Now, most of the people in Israel aren't true believers of God and are not followers of Jesus Christ. But also that shows me that God's sovereign hand is on a, a rebellious people. And I believe in the end times he will, he will bring a, a revival to Israel, to the Jews. And many of them will become believers and followers of Jesus. I also believe this book brings us to maybe one of the most important themes of the whole Bible. What is that? It's a theme that God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. Really, Obadiah is a, a, a book about a warning about pride. And it's a book about God's sovereign saving grace for humble people. And we see throughout the Bible the way that God opposes the proud, the proud people, the proud individuals. And we also see how much grace he gives to humble people. In the end, the proud will not survive. Only the humble who have surrendered to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, will be saved. Often God humbles the proud to make them humble enough to be saved. Who here can relate to that? At one point you were proud. You were, as the Bible said, a, a hater of God, a, an enemy of, of God. You thought, I could, you know, I could do my own thing. I can, I can live my own life. I don't need a God to be over me. I don't need a God to answer to. The Bible is just full of rules and regulations that I don't need to, to follow. And out of God's love and out of his grace, he came into your life and showed you how proud you were. And sometimes he uses drastic measures to do that. And again, I believe that's out of his love that he does that. Maybe it was an illness. Maybe it was a financial crisis. Maybe he allowed you to live in your sin to the point of you know, being at the bottom of the barrel, as they said, and the only way to go was to go up and reach out to him and, and be saved. So 
Uh, we, we've got to thank God for the ways that he humbles us in our pride. In the end, I think that is what God will do with the Jews. I think a lot of what we read in, the, uh, in Revelation, the end times, and the tribulation that we see there will be God's act to humble the Jews and bring them to salvation. But for now, he says that only a few will become believers. Only a remnant will be saved. It's bad news for them, but it's good news for the rest of us because this is the time of salvation for the Gentiles. It's a time in Romans, and I'm going to read from Romans here in a minute, a minute, where he says that he basically grafts us in to his family. We see that in Romans 11. Let me read there, uh, starting in verse 11. It says, again, I asked, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? He's talking about the Jews. Paul says, not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. But if their transgression means riches for the world and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will their full inclusion bring? Right? It's, it's, it's telling us there will be a full inclusion of the Jews at some point. Verse 17, dropping down a little bit. If some of the branches have been broken off, and you, though a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root. Do not consider yourself to be superior to those other branches. If you do, consider this. You do not support the root, but the root supports you. So he's talking about the fact that as Christians, we have benefited from the history of the Jewish people, from God's chosen people, right? He says, we can't be proud as Gentile believers and say, you know what, we don't need them. We don't need to respect them. You know, they're done as far as history. No, we have to still support Israel and the Jews because it was through them that we found salvation. In verse 19, it says, you will say then branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. Granted, but they were broken off because of unbelief and you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but tremble. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. If I asked you what is the greatest sin that a person could commit, what would you say? I can think of some pretty grievous sins, things like murder and rape and theft and all down the list. But I don't think those are the greatest of the sins. I think if I answer the, the, that question, I would say it's pride. Pride is the greatest sin. Think about it. It was pride that led Satan to rebel against God, be cast out of heaven. It was pride that caused Adam and Eve to sin in the garden. They said, you know what? Hey, maybe we can, maybe we can do our own thing. Maybe we can have our own knowledge. Maybe we can have our own kingdoms. It's pride that keeps every unbelieving person from knowing Jesus Christ as, as Savior. It is the greatest of the sins. Every other sin comes out of pride. Pride causes us to rebel against God. Sin is our choice to rebel against God, and it comes in many forms. Sin is at the heart of what keeps people from following Christ. That might have been you at one point. That might be at the heart of somebody you've talked to about the gospel in Jesus. They, I don't need that. No, thank you. You know, only, you know, weak-minded people need that. Only weak people need to, to follow some imaginary genie in the sky kind of thing. It's pride that keeps us from Christ. It's pride that keeps many from knowing Jesus. Pride is so strong and so devastating that only God, by his grace, can break its power. You weren't able to even break the power of pride in yourself. God supernaturally had to come into your life and do that for you. I think the verses in Obadiah that speak so greatly to this idea of pride is Obadiah 3, 4. And it says, the pride of your heart has deceived you. You who live in the clefts of the rock and make your home on the heights. You who say to yourself, who can bring me down to the ground? Though you soar like eagles and make your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. These verses obviously were directed at the Edomites and their pride of their location and their fortress and who they were and what kept them from obeying God. And even though we aren't Edomites and we don't live in that region, 
I think what happens in our lives is we start to create this, this kingdom of our hearts, this kingdom of our own lives, right? We kind of build up these kingdoms of maybe money or, you know, maybe we could even put trust in our houses or our cars or our things or our relationships or our jobs or whatever it may be. Before we know it, we're living for our own kingdom and not for God's. And before we know it, we've made our home, you know, in, in the cliffs, in the, in the mountains. Before we know it, we're not really following God's kingdom at all. And so I think there's a lot that we can relate to these Edomites in their pride. Where do you struggle with pride in your life? We all struggle somewhere, don't we? It might be different. Mine might be different than yours. Maybe you are proud about maybe your income. Think, you know what? I can kind of take on the world. I don't really have any needs because I have a certain income every week, every month, or every year, whatever it may be, and that could be a source of pride. Maybe it's your relationships. Say, hey, look at all the friends I have. Look how popular I am. Look how, how much people want me to be around them. And that may be a source of pride in your life. Maybe it's your job and just the way that maybe you've worked up the ladder, if you will, or the prestigiousness of your job, and people look at you as, as being great because maybe of your line of work. I think a lot of people struggle with addictions, and that's a source of pride in their life. I think at the heart of addiction is, I can handle this, right? This doesn't have me. I don't need help. I'll get out of this eventually. Before you know it, weeks go by, months go by, years go by, and that thing still is mastering your life because you were so prideful to get help and to ask for help. Maybe you've been dishonest. Maybe you've been greedy out of pride. Obviously, I don't know your heart, and you don't know mine, so we don't all know what that is, but God does. And we need to come to the place of just being honest with that, that we all struggle with that at times. And we need to come to him for help in our times of pride. For those of you who have not trusted Christ for salvation, the honest truth is you are committing the worst sin. And that's pride. That is what's keeping you from being a follower of Christ. And, and not being a follower of Christ is the worst sin that you have ever could commit. It's the only sin that will send you to hell. Every other sin that is in the Bible can be forgiven. I believe that there are serial killers who have found salvation in Christ that will be in heaven. I also believe that there's people that we may have thought were great people on earth, did all kinds of great things that will not be in heaven. I think we'll be surprised sometimes who we'll see that's there and who's not there. We'll still see people that we saw on TV like, how did you make it? You did that and you're here. Why? Because they humbled themselves at some point and said, you know what? I can be saved because of what Christ has done. And I think there's some people who are so prideful to the very end and say, you know what? God's going to let me in. He's going he's gonna, to he's gonna be so impressed with my life. I'm going to show up before God. I'm going to show him my resume of all the great things I've done. And he's going to be like, oh, that is amazing. Please come on into heaven. But that's not how it works. Because none of our resumes can stand up to the perfect righteousness and holiness of God. In James, James 2.10 says that if we've broken one of God's laws, we've what? We've broken all of them. It's hard to think that I'm in the same boat as a serial killer or a rapist or somebody like that because I've broken God's law. Maybe as the world looks at it, maybe not as great, but still in God's eyes, compared to his great holiness, I've broken all his laws. So my encouragement to you, if you're sitting here today or you're listening to this or maybe in the future weeks are watching this, is just be honest with the pride that you have. Just be honest that you cannot stand before God on your own righteousness. That you need a righteousness outside of yourself to save you. And so the bad news is, yes, none of us can save ourselves by our own righteousness. But the great news is that God provided a way for us to have holiness. That God provided a way for us to be righteous. The Bible says that we can have the same righteousness as Christ. That is unfathomable in my mind. That God can look at me and say that I'm as righteous as Jesus is righteous. But what had to happen for that to happen? Jesus had to give his life. He had to be sacrificed. The righteous one, the perfect one, had to take our place. Had to take on our punishment so that that could be satisfied in God's mind. His wrath could be satisfied by taking on 
the wrath that we deserved. I would like to say that it's easy to become a Christian. And a lot of people will preach that message and say, it's just so easy. Just believe these facts about what Jesus did. It's way more than just believing certain facts, people. It's, it's, a, it's a, a will of the heart to submit to King Jesus. The Bible says that we need to repent and believe. Repentance is turning away from sin, and believing is turning towards Christ and trusting him for our salvation. But I believe within that repentance and belief is the intention to follow Jesus as Lord. Jesus did it all. He paid it all. But he expects all of us in return. We can't hold back. We have to give him 100% of who we are to come into his kingdom. So I've been reading this book called Unexpected Wisdom on the Minor Prophets by the author Dan Schmidt. And it says a lot about pride in his book, about a portion about Obadiah. And he says, pride is the urge to stand alone, to stand above all else. It, it, it inevitably crowds out other people into an increasingly small space. Here's probably the most important part of the quote. It blinds one to the value of God. And pride is the natural enemy of faith. The more pride in your life, the less faith there will be. The more faith, less pride. In his book, he gives this illustration of a computer monitor, or maybe if you don't use computer monitors a lot anymore, maybe a, a flat screen TV. I don't know if you know how those things work, but they're made up of actually over two million little teeny pixels, almost like two million little light bulbs, basically. And each of those light bulbs have to turn on, turn, turn off, and, and make up colors to make that big image that you see. And so the idea in this illustration is we sometimes think we're the image on the screen, don't we? We think we are the ones that it's really all about. And the world has to be the pixels to kind of create this world that we want for ourselves. But the reality is we're not the image on the screen. We're one of the pixels. We're one of the small, itty-bitty dots in God's creation. And what is the purpose of the pixel? It's to bring glory to the image. Our job is to be the insignificant pixel to bring glory to the image who is God. Have you ever seen a TV monitor or, or a computer monitor or a TV screen that's missing a pixel? How annoying is that? What do you focus on when you look at that TV? That one little dot that is out. It could be the most amazing scene, it could be the most amazing movie, but all your focus is on that dot that's not doing its job. <laughs> you the dot? You the pixel? We all are, right? And sometimes we work and sometimes we don't. But the encouragement to you is, is realize that, yes, we're insignificant, we're small, but we play a huge part in that image, right? In the image bearing of God. And that we, when we live in a life to glorify God, we join all the other believers in the world in bringing glory to the greater picture, and who, that is Jesus Christ and God in our lives. 1 Peter 4.11 says this, If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so, like this, with the strength that God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Doesn't that fit the illustration, right? He says, if you're doing what I'm doing right now and you're speaking the word of God, speak as if you're speaking the word of God. But if maybe you're serving off on the side in a way that people don't see, see your job, see what you're doing is just the same. And don't do it in your own strength, but do it in God's strength. And in that way, you will bring much glory to him. I think we think sometimes being humble and humility is, is that person who does nothing, right? That just kind of is weak and meek and sitting on the sideline. That's not humility. Sometimes humility takes great courage. Sometimes humility takes great strength. It means doing amazing things, but doing it in such a way that the attention is not brought to yourself, but is brought to God, who is your creator. What I think is cool about this book of Obadiah, it's a book about the danger of pride, and it's a book about the importance of humility. It's kind of interesting how short the book is. It's kind of unassuming. It's a kind of humble book in 
the grand scheme of the Old Testament, up against books like Isaiah and Jeremiah, you have this little book of Obadiah, and the book's about humility. Think about the author for a minute. A lot of those other books, they make sure they know who the author is, and they tell who, where they came from, and they tell their royal line, they tell about all the relatives. What did Obadiah tell us about himself? Nothing. He doesn't tell us when he lived. He didn't tell us where he lived. He doesn't even tell us who his family is. Here's a really interesting thing. Is I don't think Obadiah is even the name of the author. Obadiah was a very common name in the Old Testament times, and it meant what? I started off by telling what Obadiah meant. It means servant of the Lord. I think the real author of Obadiah had a different name, and he says, I don't want people to even know my name, so I'm going to use this title of Obadiah, which means servant of the Lord, so that people don't even know who I am altogether. I mean, think about how often you've read this book, and it's just so just stuck in there in the middle of, of the Minor Prophets, but it is an amazing message to us about the dangers of pride and the importance of humility. I might be kind of biased, and I, I definitely don't want to sound prideful. But I think God is glorified by the many humble servants we have in our church. You know, when I look from my vantage point, and sometimes, you know, I can see things or I know things maybe that everybody knows. But I don't see anybody in church who thinks they're any better than anybody else. I know some of your occupations which obviously come with a certain salary. I know some of your titles. I know some of your family situations. But when you come together and you serve together, none of you lords any of that over the other person. And, you know, I was, I was tempted to mention names and mention what people are doing in the church and say how humble these people are. But I thought, you know, if I do that, I might tempt them to be prideful. So I'm not going to do that. But the reality is, so many of you serve in such humble ways. You don't look for fanfare. You don't look for uh, a pat on the back. And that's because of the, the depth of your faith to know that that's not what you're doing in the first place. That you serve in these ways because you want God to be glorified. You want your brothers and sisters to be loved. You want them to be served. And you don't want the attention for it. And so I think as we go forward, as long as we continue that mindset, as we continue to trust God's grace and his strength to continue to keep us humble, I know it's a dangerous prayer to pray for humility because God loves to answer that one, but sometimes we need it. But if we continue in that way, I believe that God is going to continue to use our church in, in amazing ways as we go forward, as we continue to be that one of two million pixels in God's greater scheme to bring him glory. Let's close by uh, going to the Lord and asking him for that strength to bring him glory. Father, we thank you so much for a very short and uh, maybe a book that doesn't get a lot of attention of the book of Obadiah. Maybe Obadiah was his name, maybe it wasn't. Regardless, uh, he was a humble man, a good example to us. God, he, he sensed his calling he sensed your work in his life. You gave him a vision. He wasn't afraid to call out people, call out sin. But at the same time, he wanted you to receive the glory for it. And God, that is just the temptation in our lives, God, to, to want to build ourselves up, to want to be kings of our own lives, to be gods of our own lives. Um, God, help keep us humble. And I, I trust you'll do that uh, because that is when we really receive joy. That is really when we receive uh, the excitement of being a follower of you is when we aren't the main picture, but you are. And so uh, we just pray that we can continue to do that as a church, as individuals, and that you'll be greatly glorified through it. In Christ's name, amen. amen. Please stand. <laughs>
uh, may God uh, give you his grace to be uh, that, that body that is a holy sacrifice uh, to him, and that he would give you grace to be that humble servant to bring him glory. And so I pray that you have a, a great week and that you'll see God in, in many ways uh, throughout this week. So God bless, and uh, hopefully we'll see you next Sunday. Have a good week.